when Vicki and John and I talk about doing keynotes, you know, we are always talking about wanting to, uh, you know, have trendy stuff and a range of topics and, you know, representing different people and everything. But we always talk about how the hardest box to fill is somebody who's actually interesting to listen to talk for any length of time and, uh, you know, and who can really keep going for, uh, so, you know, uh, for, you know, we're going to actually mix it up a little bit here, but for who you really want to talk to, for, hear talk for an hour, and when you walk away from that, you think, wow, I could have listened to that like the whole rest of the night. And Dorothy is really that kind of person, no pressure. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, she really, she's so passionate about the work, and she's not afraid to, like, show that passion in her work. She is, you know, a little bit of a workaholic, but, you know, we're, you know, we're working on that. And I found out last night, you know, she and I are sharing a bathroom over in the uh, Bragg building and I found out last night how tolerant and gracious she can be because I, I, I locked my sweet mate out of the bathroom. I felt like, like so back to like our undergraduate days and, and she texted me like three times and I was like so crashed out that I didn't hear the phone and so she <laughs> couldn't get to the bathroom like all night last night and, and she was still talking to me this morning so that just goes to tell you like what a wonderful person Dorothy really is. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so we are so, but we're starting off. Uh, so we, you, so you've data blitzed and you've you've postered, which by far is my favorite format of the traditional conference formats. So for this opening keynote, we are doing something a little bit different. She is going to give a talk for fifteen ish minutes um, and, uh, and then afterwards I am going to interview her and we are going to start this journey that Anjali called us out to do to hear a little bit more about her professional story and how she has gotten to where she is now, where she sees herself going in the future and I think that one of the, the things that is really missing from this field is that we hear so many stories of adversity or victimization or even in the media you hear just, you know, it's so easy to find those stories anywhere you look. But we don't hear very many stories about these, these professional paths that people take who are on these, you know, social justice missions to try to have a little bit less burden of adversity in the world and a little bit more resilience in the world and how do you become the kind of person that has has that sort of impact and if you're you know lucky and fortunate that you'll be the sort of person that leaves the world like a little better off than you found it and so that is what we're hoping to do so we are going to get a little bit of a taste of some of the fantastic work she's doing but then we're going to try to spend a little time getting her to share her story with us and with that I am going to turn it over to Dorothy Espelage. John you want to help? So I am quite honored, um, and I do feel a little pressure here to uh, talk to you about 22 years of research and a journey and 15 minutes. Um, but everybody knows that I can talk fast. And I'm going to try to do diff something different here. I'm going to talk about social emotional learning and kind of the, some of the studies that we've done. But I want to leave you with some of the current work that's happening between AIR, where's Allison? Uh, she's back there. So um, AIR and CASEL, which is Roger Weisberg's Consortium of Academic Social Emotional Learning, um, as well as others across the country to rethink some of the ways in which maybe SEL is falling short in helping us address inequities in education. So this is risky, and you can just tell me don't ever do that one again, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, I haven't gotten here by playing it safe, I can tell you that. So there are some of you that don't recognize social emotional learning. Social emotional learning really did emerge out of a 1994 conference where a lot of folks came together with life skills, social skills, health education to come up with, and Roger Weisberg and his group there in Chicago came up with these different domains of self-awareness, social awareness, um, self-management, relationship skills, responsible decision making, and really these are thought to be these core types of social emotional learning competencies that kids need. I think more and more we realize that all of us need this, right? So, so much of this work in the beginning focused on the kids and we're going to end this 15 minute talk talking about how we might have to go back to the adults that are failing these children and we give these children really great, wonderful SEL competencies, but it's in, in a place in which uh, adults undo some of that or um, 
kind of fail our kids and therefore we have limited sustainability of these findings. It's very, very clear from social emotional learning and also just basic developmental research of Terry Moffitt's work and other and Stephanie Jones who's doing brilliant work in the space of SEL that we do know that if kids have non-cognitive self-control and I have an issue with just non-cognitive itself but that would be a whole another 15 minutes that there are predict these really do predict long-term outcomes and I think that's why there's such a focus on early childhood social emotional learning in this country, which, by the way, I don't think is going to go away um, in this administration. So if you're looking for a new area of research, early childhood, social emotional learning is probably where you want to be. Um, we also know from a number of recent studies and meta-analyses that the effect size are pretty decent if these programs are implemented with fidelity. Right? So this is the big problem that we've done and we've created these really um, well thought out, developmentally appropriate programs or approaches or frameworks, however you want to say, but the reality is is the practitioners out there, and I understand the pressure, uh, they're piecemealing these, these curriculum and, and programs and frameworks such that the developmental sequencing really kind of falls apart. So we do have to have support for our teachers to administer this. Administrators need to be supportive of the space and time. Um, and certainly we're starting to, and it was just word on the street last week, as Roger Weisberg is allowing mindful programs to be reviewed through his Castle Review. Very, very optimistic to think about, you know, SEL is not mindfulness, but mindfulness is part of SEL, right? And so we're finding some good effects both academically and socially uh, for these programs. So it's very, very clear that social emotional learning, basic kind of things that kids need of self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, everything that you guys need to do your work very well, patience, problem solving, conflict management, emotion regulation, all the skills that they have listed outside of the of this uh, place here. And but what really helped us within the area of social emotional learning, and hopefully some of the questions you ask will say, is there some things that have really shifted? This, thank you, Allison, for this meta-analysis here. In 2011, I always say fell from the sky. Like there was just a beautiful, I'm not extremely religious, but I am pretty spiritual and I do believe in other lives and stuff, and they're videotaping this, and the things you're going to learn about me right now. But for this, really was a game changer for us in the United States to think about social emotional learning, not only as a way in which to improve academic functioning in kids, but also to think about violence prevention and pro-social behavior. Because imagine if you're talking to someone in the Trump administration and you say that if you do social emotional learning, your test scores will be higher. It's a very different conversation than I'm going to reduce bullying and sexual harassment in that administration. Certainly we do know that um, within the Republican arm of this, they call it workforce development. And we can call it social emotional learning more on the Democratic side. And so this was really, when in fact you could say if you have a program that it includes social emotional learning where we're giving kids basic life skills, social skills, success skills, you're 11 percentile higher test scores. That's profound. You don't have to be a teacher to recognize that's a significant gain in academic functioning. But we also know that it promoted um, prosocial behavior and discouraged disruptive behavior. But what was also very clear, and hopefully I'm <coughs> representing this okay for you, Allison, is that this meta-analysis also pointed to the ways in which the components need to roll out within the context of school-based work or community-based work around SEL. And it has to be sequenced step-by-step -step, uh, training approach, active forms of learning for the kids, right? How did you learn times tables? Why is it that I am 48 years old and I can say six times six is 36 and eight times eight is 64 and nine times nine is 81? They drilled it, right? Oftentimes, teachers and practitioners think, well, we went over that empathy lesson and perspective taking lesson and then we went out on the playground and it's as if we didn't do the lesson. Like, can we think about social emotional learning as a lifelong skill development that all of us need, right? Um, and certainly explicit learning goals. So that's kind of the academic stuff. I'm at five minutes, all right. I wanted to just show you a few of, we do a number of large scale evaluations. Um, this was our K through five trial where we wanted to see what would happen. We know we have these results for social emotional learning, but what if we actually train the adults around bullying prevention and not just the kids? I'm very much concerned of us just focusing for the last two decades on the kids and then placing them back in a context where teachers have challenging, challenges managing their classroom. Notice how I say that. They have challenges of understanding the ways in which they could perpetuate some of this behavior in the classroom around bullying and exclusion and those types of things. So we thought this was important to do. So just give you some sense, you guys can kind of just not let this slide go over your head, but just kind of look at, we're talking about empathy and skill development. These are the little kids, right? So this is pre-K through five. And I'm gonna give you just some basic results of the, the older kids with self-report. 
Um, but in the training, increasingly, the Institute of Educational Science, which is our research arm, uh, the Department of Education, which still does exist uh, today, I haven't checked the news, um, <laughs> may, not, may not be there next week, uh, but they're really committed to the adults, right? So in the special ed call that we all put in for, they really focused on adult professional development, and they're starting to understand trauma, and they're starting to understand that we have to work in these adults to create resilient classrooms, because we cannot do it without the adults on board, and that's I'm going to talk more about that. Um, and then the kids got some lessons. And essentially, we had three arms of this. We had a one-year delayed condition in two communities that were very much um, what we would call the hollowing out of America. So this is a small towns where there was booming industry, and all of a sudden it goes, right? So everybody leaves, and who's left? The most needy families, right? Um, and those that are dealing with poverty and other types of things. So this is a design issue for me. So I couldn't wait two years and not implement with these kids. So it was a one-year wait list. Um, so I'm going to give you. And then we had just the social-emotional learning condition schools. And then those that got the adult training alongside it. Because what we were hearing in the basic literature, the few people that focus on bullying and teachers, is they do not feel competent. And in some cases, they're engaging in very ineffective, non-evidence-based procedures that's making victimization work worse in our schools. Okay, so what do we find? I'm just gonna show you this here. Significant reductions in attitudes supportive of bullying and attitudes supportive of bullying. I felt so good about that, to say it twice. Um, and, so, and second step plus the BPU. So if you give, yes, do the social emotional learning, which we've already documented in developmental research that you will promote pro-social behavior, reduce violence behavior. But in addition to this, we move the needle around bullying if you talk to the kids specifically about this. And I believe, I, I didn't have enough money to have a fourth arm, but if I were to do this again, I'd have a fourth arm where we just isolated the teacher training because I think that's really what is changing the dynamic. And um, if IES funds us, maybe that would be a nice study if anybody wants to collaborate on it. I like the little kids for like 20 years I studied middle school and high school kids and then I did this study and I was like, why? What was wrong with me? They're so nice. They like tug on your, don't they? They tug and they say, I remember you. And I'm like, that's not what they say in seventh and eighth grade. <laughs> They're like, what? yeah, I remember you. We're going to do this survey again, same questions, repeat the questions. Right? It's so true, right? And that's like the clean version of what they say. <laughs> I do a lot of my work in Chicago public schools, and so it's very colorful. My graduate students get dates, and I get yelled at. Anyway, so um, preliminary analysis says that there is something to be said about potentially the teacher training and talking specifically with the kids about bullying beyond social emotional learning. So that's kind of promising and we are trying to get um, a grant to do this research in Nashville, St. Louis and where do I live? Florida. Yeah. I just moved to Florida so it's new to me. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk to you about my middle school trial. So SEL, what is really happening around social-emotional learning across is that most states are requiring it, um, or at least bullying prevention K through 12. And so we're trying to isolate what needs to happen at elementary school, and it's clear that we've always kind of moved the needle better with the little kiddos than we have the middle school kids. And not that you guys remember being in the sixth grade, but you're nice in the sixth grade, and then you go off for the summer and you come back a different child in the seventh grade, and you're totally non-compliant by the eighth grade, right? Only to come back to center when you go to high school, right? So all of that developmentally, and I say it in a nice way, but the research would support that, that we have to think about what is it and how do we target the different developmental standpoint. Well, if anyone's read any of my research, I have fought very hard uh, with the recommendation of Sherry Hemby to break down the silos of research. And for decades, I've studied the overlap between bullying, homophobic name calling, sexual harassment, and teen dating violence. I am not that bully researcher over here that somehow just thought like, poof, it like just happens, it shows up, and like it has no kind of precursor development to other forms of violence and violence against women. But all my friends are here, so they, they get it too. Um, and so Centers for Disease Control has been very, very committed to trying to reduce sexual violence because it's such a challenging area. And my colleague Emily Rothman can attest to this. And so we wanted to do this trial with their sexual violence um, outcomes. Now this was a, a middle school program in 36 schools in Illinois and Kansas, and that would be important um, to see, you'll see that that's kind of important. And it put, puts on a lens of the social political nature of this work. Um, okay, so this program is actually based on risk and protective factors model, a little bit of bullying, not too much. Middle school to, students don't even really call it bullying, they call it drama and all kinds of other things. Positive approach and developmental needs. 
And so what we did was we went and recruited 36 schools from Illinois and Kansas, and we surveyed 3,600 kids across four time points across three years. So by the end of this three-year randomized clinical trial, if you were a kid recruited in sixth grade, you would have 41 lessons of social emotional learning at the end of the three years. So when I was waking up, and anybody that does RACTs, you wake up in panic attacks, wondering what is happening, and we're using this millions of dollars, and is anything going to move? So here, I was convinced um, that with the risk and protective factors model, kind of drawing upon Hawkins and Catalano, that we would have some movement over time. The teachers implemented, because I believe that teachers need social-emotional learning, um, and I believe that they benefit from that. I didn't measure that, but I also do believe that I saved some marriages during this trial. Because you can imagine if you're like doing a lesson and then, you know, your partner, you go home and you're, you're like, I'm just going to like, you know, regulate my emotions like I just taught my kids to in the classroom. That'll be another study. So I'm sure somebody, Templeton, maybe want to study, study that. Saving marriages. <laughs> Saving marriages, Templeton. They're all so kind and gratitude. So in the first year, we reduced physical fighting by 42%. That's pretty good, right? Healthy People 2020 says by 2020 we're going to reduce physical fighting on school property by 3%. That would be indicator 142, just in case you're curious and you want to fact check that. This is real news, people. Real, real research. <laughs> it's just so hard not to, right? I mean, I try. I looked in the mirror. I was like, act like a professor. Just do it once. <laughs> it falls apart real fast. Um, in year two, we actually had reductions in sexual harassment, uh, perpetration, and homophobic name calling big numbers, but only in the state of Illinois. During this particular year, the state of Kansas, my name is Dorothy, I can talk about Kansas all I want. Um, <laughs> uh, they had an anti-gay bill that passed, and that was if you owned a company and someone came in that you thought was uh, LGBT, you could ask them to leave. Well, I'm sorry, this work is totally social political, and you can imagine what was happening at the dinner tables as that was on the evening news, and then the teachers have to do sexual harassment curriculum. Okay, it is so social political. However, when we did a meta-analysis of the implementation data, we, were, we moved all forms of victimization and perpetration, including cyber, including homophobic name calling, and including sexual harassment. So, and you can see kind of the comment there that in fact, if these teachers prepared the lesson as if they did an academic lesson, if they were supported by the administrators to do this work, um, we reduced effect sizes, high, like 50% reduction of all forms. Year three, because research is just this way, we've got an indirect effect of reducing all forms of victimization and perpetration through the decrease in delinquency. Now, that's significant because we were in Chicago public schools where there's a little delinquency. But the reviewers are like, really? And I'm like, yeah, they don't let me into schools where there's no delinquency. They need my resources, right? So I have, let me see how I'm doing here, Sherry. I am. Okay, I'm good. Okay. So the reality is I can pretend to stand here and say, oh, SEL is the panacea. The reality is this is some of the most challenging work you will ever do if you do school-based research. So graduate students think very hard about this. I studied fruit flies in high school, okay? And then like rats in undergrad. And then I found this developmental psychologist. I was like, what do you mean you go into the schools? And it was downhill from there. So this is very, very challenging work. It's sociopolitical in nature. I am scared to death of what is going to happen in the area of bullying and sexual violence in our schools and what programming will be accepted. And that's depressing to think how far. When I started this work in 1993, there was one state that had a bullying law. Every state has some form of legislation, right? But when you see that transgender guidance already went away from the OCR, very slippery slope, which just energizes me more, just to work even more, Sherry. However, there is a concern in and that when we think about social emotional learning and we understand the political context of our schools and the rise in hate crimes and the rise in prejudice and discrimination and what I would say the covert kind of biases and racism that we have are overt in our schools now if you're not spending time there. It really is not uh, difficult to hear implicit bias comments from teachers on a regular basis about our ethnic minority kids and immigrant population. So now this, we started to, so AIR and A ERA and CASEL, we're already starting to talk about this. In Hoffman's 2009 paper that is cited, I encourage you to get that and really sit with this Hoffman paper that, I'm gonna give you some quotes on this. So, um, so Denman and Weisberg were talking in 2004 about the importance of under integrating equity. It was mostly lip service really, to be honest. 
There's a lot of head nodding to diversity within SEL programs, and it's only now that there's a handful of people that are doing some of this really, really progressive work. We've got a long way to go. Um, but certainly, Roger has talked about this since the 2000s. This is the Hoffman paper that we can make sure you, you get. I, even if you're not doing SEL work, I think it's a brilliant paper to really challenges the ways in which we put uh, skills within these five domains. Um, there's a recognition from Hoffman that cultural norms affect the interpretation of emotional experiences. And so recognizing that not every program is going to work for every kid from the same background. Um, and she also argued um, that it really these programs are Eurocentric views of behavioral control. Okay. Um, and a lot of this work is also being done by Jaegers. I think that's how he says his name at Michigan. So yeah, if you're if you're looking for after-school programs or alternative settings to really do some SEL and equity work, please check his work out. It will bring you to tears of how talk about resiliency. So he wants to shift from this deficit model, which SEL is kind of a deficit model. Yes, um, and as we heard from Allison, just because you have reduced violence doesn't mean you've you've inserted pro-social behavior. One, it's not the other. Um, but going through the competence and resilience promotion programs reflect a shift toward creating context of foster youth assets and address developmental needs. Brilliant, brilliant work. Um, I also just, we were talking about this, Katie, too. I, I, I hear oftentimes in the schools that they expect these programs to work for everyone at the same level, and it's a, it, heightens, takes me back to colorblindness. This idea that somehow we're not going to recognize the very rich historical aspects of culture and other types of things, and that focusing on the commonalities between individuals and saying that, it, that we're not going to take a cultural lens is unfortunate. And so Anne Gregory is another person that you're going to start seeing writing about this, and this is a chapter that she gave to me that will be out soon. She didn't want me to share it with anybody, which is a shame. But um, hopefully look for this, and we'll make sure that we get it to Sherry uh, in case, you know, as we follow through here. But she really argues with her colleagues that we need to be, really integrate this consciousness about disparities in schooling and opportunity gaps and history of unequal schooling. The minute I say something to somebody about the fact that our education is based on a tax structure that's like so antiquated and we're never going to have equality, they just got to shut down. Like, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to move my family over here where the tax base is better, where, where supposedly the schools are better. Um, and so we need to think about kind of the beliefs and behaviors of groups that are bound to history and are passed down from generation to generation. That's resiliency, right? So as, as a kid from Appalachia, that poster over there, that's totally me. Uh, when I went, I came from Southwest Virginia, grew up on a dirt road in trailer park and foster care and military. Woo, talk about the microaggressions, right? Which I like them now, because I'm like, I, I'm, I'm Appalachian. What do you got to say? That's to challenge this. What do you got to say about that? So what Ann Gregory and others are doing, and I think you're going to see a push for this, is to get the educators, practitioners, well-meaning social workers, psychologists that don't understand that these programs of SEL are really <coughs> Eurocentric, is to ha have them start thinking about their social emotional learning. Um, and I've only picked out three out of the five because of time. But how do we get teachers and educators and administrators and general population to improve their own accuracy of their self-perception? Educators need to consider whether they hold negative stereotypes about students' cultural and stylistic codes. Right? How do we jump to kind of, kind of conclusions about what we see? And I'm just going to kind of, we'll make sure that you get this PowerPoint um, and we can follow up more on this. But what about social awareness? What's your perspective taking, your empathy, your appreciation of diversity and respect for others? So can you adopt a social, cultural, historical orientation to your work? I'll tell you, not many teachers do. Teachers are quite overwhelmed and we as human beings like to categorize. It's just much more simple to put them in boxes. We start thinking about diversity and culture and history, it's complex. Well, we're complex individuals, and every kid that we work with is different than the next kid, and they have a story, right, Anjali? Yes. So understanding more about systematic racism, abuse of power. I am very cognizant that when I'm in Southside Chicago, these say white privilege, right? That's their assumption, and that's okay. And I also recognize they see white privilege researcher and understand the historical hurts between the University of Illinois and Southside Chicago. And, you know, I have to tell you, 
What about self-management? This one I'm really struggling with because I believe that my self-management skills are the best ever and that everybody should use them, right? So, but this is this idea like the way that you manage stress, do you expect that the kids in your classroom or the kids that you're working with do the same? Yeah. So educators recognize whether they have culturally laden expectations for good self-management and what it looks like. Because I'm an active problem solver and so I don't understand why people have to like fret over stuff and avoid, like just get her done. Well, that's not how people are, right? And it may not be the ways in which you're encouraged to regulate your emotions either. And then you're, when you get this, these are just some questions that Anne has posed in some of her um, writings and professional development. How has your background influenced what you see as appropriate classroom and school behavior? Or is it the behavior on the bus when you're taking the bus or when you're in a convenience store? Or it, all kinds of things. I just had a, a girl in our high school study, and I know I probably should wrap up soon, but I'm kind of, get, this is when I really got on, you get, get on roll here, right, Sherry? Like, three minutes, okay. So I was just, fine, I, the roll will end soon. Uh, uh, we were just doing focus groups from African American girls in our big justice grant around school safety, and she was talking about the, the ways in which she's treated in her AP class, where there's three African Americans and they sit over there and then the whites sit over here. And, and because she's so loud, you know, she couldn't, this is how, and the teacher's the way that this teacher, this white teacher reacts to her. And she's fully self-aware and social aware. And she challenges this. I mean, she's a change agent, right? Kind of. So um, what types of cultural, linguistic, or stylist presentations feel more comfortable or familiar to you than others? These are things that we want educators and adults and community members to start thinking about. How might implicit racial bias impact your decision making as an educator? This is tough stuff. This is really challenging. And what I've done is when I talk to teachers about this, I personalize it. I tell them my story. Here we go, Katie. Katie gave me permission to do this, didn't you? Yeah. No. Yep. So I had not taught at the University of Illinois for four years. And because I had grants, because we don't have a state budget and I have to keep the lights on. So, that, because that's my job. And I walked into my class, theories of psychotherapy, psychology class, and about one third to two thirds of the students were Asian American. Hmm. Process it how you want to process it, but I thought I was in the wrong class, right? Because I had that Asian American stereotype in my head, the implicit bias was this can't be a psychology class because Asian Americans are over there and we're in an engineering school. So I just kind of stood there, said psychology, there is a psychotherapist, they're like, yeah. And at that moment, look at me, Miss Social Justice, got it going on, and still that was triggered. When I tell that story, you can see 500 teachers just going, okay, wait a minute, okay, she's not lecturing at us, she's like, she, she's telling the truth. And then they have a space where they can say, yes, this is how I view ethnic minorities in my school. This is how it affects the ways in which my expectations for their behavior. What about code switching? What about your understanding of snitching, which is alive and well as far as our school safety kinds of issues? The one question that Anne asked, historical harms. I, would, I said to Anne, I said, I think we should say current harms right, because it's not historical anymore. So we have to think about the ways in which uh, you experience trustworthiness. Again, self-management questions, and you're welcome to use these. I want to end with this, what I find is a really um, thoughtful <coughs> quote. While currently stressing links between SEL and academic achievement, program literature also places emphasis on ideas of caring community and diversity. Remember the head nods? This is what we're doing. We want, right, we're into kindness. Random acts of kindness all over the place. Um, however, recommended practices across programs tend to undermine these ideals by focusing on emotional behavioral control strategies that privilege individualistic models of SEL. How do we create SEL at the system level? How do we create ones that are sensitive to diversity in the background? The promise of SEL to foster increased achievement and quality equity in American education may not be realized until, unless more work is done to connect these ideals with practices and to address the political and cultural assumptions that are built into contemporary approaches. So how do we work now in 2017 when we have some of the most challenging social political context right now that kids are having to deal with? And I think as, as adults, we need to name it, own it, and work very, very hard to integrate equity into the SEL programs and frameworks that we're using to approach all kinds of risky behaviors among kids 
and how can we, because SEL is very promising around protective, but it may be protective only for a certain population if we do not adapt them based on what we know about diversity. Thank you. What you said, I hope we will come back to and, and touch on again, but what I uh, want to do a little bit is what we talked about earlier and try to get you to talk a little bit more about your your professional story. So we're going to go back, not like all the way back, but, uh, <laughs> but back at the beginning of like your professional career. <laughs> and so uh, you started off, which perhaps you gave a little bit of a sense of in your talk, with really focusing more on bullying research and a very traditional risk factors. This is what's correlated with bullying and and now you have shifted very much to this prevention approach and so can you talk a little bit about how, how did you get interested in bullying research and then how did you shift off of this more basic factor, risk factor approach to really focusing on solving the problem? Yeah, so it's kind of uh, 22 years, right? So I s did my dissertation on eating disorders. So how did I end up with this bullying thing, right? A little bizarre. Um, I pretended to know SPSS and psychometric theory as a graduate student at Indiana University, and I took a job for a CDC-funded project. Because that's part about being resilient, right? Like, of course, I know it. Give me the job. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I was doing, I learned psychometric theory really fast, and I was in charge of doing the evaluation tool for this random, you're going to love this, randomized clinical trial where they're going to use the computer to prevent violence. 1993, it was a big deal. And so Chris Bosworth was the PI on that, and I said to her, you know, I was looking at all these scales, and I said, there's this guy over in Norway called Dan Olveus, and he's talking about whipping boys, and he's talking about bullying. And then I went to the literature in the United States, and there was five articles written on bullying, and it was largely in the special ed literature of Hoover and Hazler. And I said, why don't we develop a scale to get to this, what we were calling really at that point, much more instrumental aggression and proactive aggression and trying to get to that. And I also trained in social psychology, so I wasn't real keen on priming them. So I had behavioral indicators of behavior, whether it's teasing or exclusion. Turned out in that randomized clinical trial, we did not uh, prevent physical aggression. And that was in the 90s, so kids were fighting at school a lot more than they are now. But we did move the needle on that um, area, what we called bullying, if you will. And then that, that just kind of took off. But then I realized, I was like, wait a minute, like, why are we adopting these programs from other countries? We don't, have any, don't even have the research base. I mean, unless you really just thought it was all aggression, there's aggression literature, but there wasn't really much literature on bullying. And so we just started to do more of that epidemiological work. We were not even assessing bullying in our national longitudinal data sets. I don't know when you guys started talking about it, but um, I mean, you guys are the big data. 98. So that kind of took off, and then um, we started to do focus groups and interviews with American kids because I wasn't convinced that what I was reading about in Finland and Norway was even applicable here, right? We're still very diverse kind of country, and I saw different contexts. And, and so um, then I had a paper come out where I said that some kids that engage in high rates of bullying are popular. Well, that just threw the aggression researchers through the roof. What do you mean? How can mean and cruel people be popular, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And so then that just kind of took off. I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, finish that. Yeah. I can't think of any, you know, Nobody. national examples of that. No. <laughs> Um, and so then we just started to do a lot of studies, both trying to identify largely risk factors, but also protective factors model, right? So what are the outcomes for these kids? And we just started to do lots and lots of studies. And then I got frustrated because we were um, seeing that prevention program, so the Olveus bullying prevention program, we spent $3 million on in a trial in South Carolina, and the data have never been published. And what do I say to Dan the man when I see him? I say, Dan the man. <laughs> Show me the data. This is actually what she does say to him when she <laughs> sees him. <laughs> on the dance floor. I'm like, come on, I, I show you my data, show me yours. Um, that was going to end up on YouTube somewhere. Um, so finally, when the 
resources were just drained in education, you couldn't be on NREP if you didn't have consistent data and replication. So he was finally taken off of NREP, um, but this ship had sailed. Like he was in so many of our schools and we couldn't get funding in this area because it was a proven program. So I went to Congress and I went to Senate and I did whatever webinar I could and I exposed him in every publication known to man. And I just wanted to say, look, it's just American teachers. They're not, one, they're not as respected as Norwegian teachers. I know nothing about Norway teachers, but I know they get paid more, they're more respected, and they didn't have a no child left behind kind of context at that point in Norway. And so he was just like, what is up with these American teachers? They will not implement. I said, no, you need to feed them and pay them. That's how you get them to implement. So we finally, in 19, it was after Columbine, so probably around 2000, seven, eight, nine, ten, seven years ago, the federal government started allotting monies for us to develop programs with American kids. And I'm, I'm sorry, but your, what works in Norway is not going to really be helpful for me in Southside Chicago, right? Now this is happening again, because the Kiva program is now our big thing from Finland. Have you been to Finland? <laughs> I was there two years ago, I saw one person of color and I hugged him and he was like, what is wrong with you? I was like, I don't know, I just like, I do. <laughs> Like, oh. So I, I think that, one, we just need to understand this context and what I implement in Southside Chicago and what I implement in Gainesville, Florida, or what I implement in Miami-Dade, it, context matters. And so, so, yes. So how did you end up with SEL programs then as the alternative to Olvaeus? Okay, after much therapy, okay? Okay. So I have this therapist called Eva Bloom. Okay. Yeah, she gets I thought a lot that of, was a joke. But no, okay. it's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I would have a joke like everybody needs a therapist. Okay. And I was really having this existential crisis because no one was listening to me. And I had good meaning colleagues that would just ignore some of the sexual, the homophobic language, the LGBT victimization. They just ignore because it it's not safe. So that's frustrating me. And then we had, you know, schools implementing haphazardly these programs that we got from other countries. And just name it, right? So I started to write things like, why is bullying prevention failing miserably in the United States? And I would put this on my PowerPoint. And I took my PowerPoint to therapy one day, and I said, Eva, help me. And she said, change the title, pushing the field forward. And when we did some reflection, and I was just like, wait a minute. I've read Sherry's work, John's work. They said break down the silos, right? They talk about the overlapping risk and protective factors in their monograph. If you, you should have like a signing of your monograph while you're here. I've been pushing that thing all over the world. Um, Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> and so drawing upon some of their recommendations for where we needed to go, especially if we have limited resources, and, and going back to Hawkins and Conolato's work around kind of the spectrum of problem behavior, then the SEL meta-analysis fell from the sky in 2011, and then the Tofty and Farrington meta-analysis fell the same year. It was like the meta-analysis showers, and that showed that we were failing, we were not doing well in Canada, America, and Australia. So I'm not a historian, put those three countries together, might have some commonalities, right? And so, I, and then the funding started to come out. So we finally were convincing CDC and NIJ to evaluate some programs and that meta-analysis helped us to leverage social-emotional learning and it fit with that risk and protective factors and, and understanding our basic research that kids that, are vic that have challenging social skills, um, that don't know how to communicate and kind of or they have challenges with that, are more likely to be victimized. Those kids that are not the Machiavellian bullies, but the bullies that are very effective in their aggression, have impulse control problems. So all of that fit really nicely with the social emotional learning kind of context. Hmm. Okay. So, and then you added in this, this piece about homophobia. Yeah. So that really, I would say came fairly out of the blue in terms of like where the field was at the time. So tell us the story about how that came to pass. Yeah, so it was Paul Petit, who's a colleague of mine, uh, former student, is a colleague, yes, that was good, at Boston College. We were doing some interviews with kids in some local middle schools, and we were asking them about the motivations of certain victimization they were experiencing in these middle schools. And one boy, seventh grader, just was a little frustrated with our interview protocol. We probably didn't pilot it. And he was like, look, lady, it's very interesting what you're asking, but you are not getting to what is so frustrating on a daily basis in this school. And that is being called a fag and a gay. From the morning it starts to the end, and, he, and we just started asking these questions. But he's like, look, I don't even know what I'm attracted to. Like, I like my Xbox. 
and these are my friends that are doing it, and it just, I don't want to come to school, and it just gets old. And we started asking those questions and developed a homophobic content agent target scale or something. And we started doing studies and found that 50% of the bullying in many of our studies was homophobic in nature. And it was largely among kind of boy bantering friends, um, but then we also found that even if you're friends, there were still longitudinally uh, bad out adverse outcomes for these kids, right? High depression, anxiety, and other types of things. It was at the same time that we started to do some work with GLSEN, which is the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. And, and I worked with Dane County, who surveys 30,000 kids every two years, and they ask about sexual orientation, right? So really what's happened is these data sets started to, to assess this because we saw it as important, but we didn't really have national data that, that measured sexual orientation. Because, you know, if you ask them their sexual orientation, they might think, twice about it, right? And so then we just started to do these longitudinal models that said, wait a minute, bullying is a precursor to homophobic name calling, precursor to sexual violence, precursor to teen dating violence in high school. And then other researchers start getting on board with this um, and people were using the scale if they were in places that they could do this work. You can't do this work everywhere in America. It's little conservative pockets that just like, whoo, well, I don't want to talk about that because they hear sexual harassment and they say, think it's sex, Sherry. <laughs> yes, I know, yes, well. Indeed, I will, like, tr will try to go off on that. So speaking of uh, conservative pockets, so you talked Ooh. a little bit in your talk about being from Appalachia, mm -hmm. you know, you go Appalachia, and, uh, and, but you also talked a lot about working in Chicago schools mm -hmm. and a lot about uh, implicit biases and intersectionality and all these like racial and cultural issues. And so as, you know, uh, a, nice young girl from Appalachia, can you tell, I mean, you know, the, so the process of getting, uh, you know, having your consciousness, <laughs> conscious, <laughs> consciousness raised about that, yeah. um, uh, you know, that, that's, so that's, that can be a hard process because there's a lot about, you know, mainstream white American culture that's like, don't look here, there's no racism right. here, right. you don't need to talk about that. I mean, you talked about the pressure on a lot of these schools or teachers or whatever to be colorblind or culture blind. So how did you become less colorblind and less culture blind growing up where you grew up? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, so... I mean, there's lots of different exposures. So I was in foster care, and I, I had some foster care parents of color. So that, and I grew up military, which is very diverse. So I think those pockets, um, unlike the, the last few years in high school in Appalachia, was different. I mean, for me, I've just always had a focus on social justice. I've been watching 60 Minutes on Sunday nights since I was six. There's something about 60 Minutes. I don't know what it is. I didn't really understand it. I really love it, and I missed it, I think, last night, so I'm a little... <laughs> Got to watch that. Um, so I've always had a social justice. I've always been that kid that stuck up for other kids. I can't see social injustices and not... That. So it's just part of... And I'm pretty sure that didn't come from anybody in my family. I think that that was just my pull. I have high empathy. So even when you were talking, I started to cry, and I was like, why are you doing this to me? My makeup. And so I, it, that's just how it was for me. To be honest, um, to do the work in Southside Chicago, which is largely African American and Hispanic, or downstate, which is rural, it's all about building relationships. It took me years to build relationships and trust in these communities. But I also didn't come in just saying, I have face for you, you know, I'm going to come in, do what I need to do, and then leave. And so that's why I stayed in Illinois for two decades. I'm not a Midwesterner, man. That was a long time to stay there. <laughs> and um, with my weirdness of the East Coast and the fact that I speak my mind. And um, yeah, so I'm hurting a little bit in Gainesville because they don't know who I am. And it's about doing this work is about relationships. So many of you that are doing, whether you're practitioners or if you're doing community-based work, you have to spend that time, years, building trust and doing things um, to to give back to the community, right? So when we do school-based work, we collect your data, we come back, we go to your parents, we show you the data, we go to your basketball games. I subscribe to every newspaper in the districts and where I work. I want to understand if we want to bring change. So for me, I, I, it's, 
it's a lot of process and it's one of those things that I would love to write a paper about how to do effective school-based work that's collaborative in nature and not one-sided because there's plenty of school-based researchers, not out of my lab, that don't give back. They simply, yeah. they may not even report the data back. What are you talking about? You just took classroom instructional time from these kids that really need that classroom instructional time. So I, I've just tried to, to be in the communities and, and just recognize that there's just some folks that are gonna see me um, in a light. I remember this story where I was going into, um, it was one of the schools in Inglewood, Bright Elementary. I remember like it was yesterday and it upset me so much and this turned out to be a big advocate for me, but I walked in and the principal was yelling at this third grader and in front of everybody, shaming him, not sure what he had done, but withdrawing the social uh, ice cream hour thing. And like, I'm almost in tears because remember, I have empathy, perspective taking and personal distress. Like, I just feel it in my body. And so she scared me so much. It was probably like secondary PTSD for me that I just kind of fled and I found the social worker. I was like, okay, where are we meeting? And she's like, well, the principal me. I said, I just saw the principal. And so she darted me off to a thing and she said, you're okay. And my heart's like racing and I'm feeling for this because I want to say something, but I'm not going to say something. And then I looked at the list and she's in my intervention condition. I was like, oh my goodness. So she comes in and then she yells at me. And then I finally just looked at her and I was like, look, I just felt for him. Like, I just felt for him, I don't, I know, I don't know your norms, I just wanted to get away from you yelling, and it wasn't that I was being disrespectful, so I just, I said, I actually don't, just don't need this. Like, I'm just trying to save the children. And then she <laughs> finally was like, okay. And I was a white woman in Southside, where I was offered crack on the way in, like, you know, I mean, it's, and she turned out to be, and she finally just said, Okay, baby girl, we're fine. We're going to be fine. I was like, really, we're going to be fine? We're going to do some belly breathing around here? Because I'm, like, stressed out. Well, I don't think that kid should go to the social ice cream thing. <laughs> I fought for him. I was like, what did he do that he can't get some ice cream? Yeah. So I mean, you just have, but you have to go, feel uncomfortable in spaces. Like, you yeah. just have to feel yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. So how mm -hmm. do you manage feeling uncomfortable in spaces? Belly breathing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> belly breathing. Most of the time, I'm just sitting in the office because the principal doesn't know I'm there, so I just sit there and I talk to the kids. And then, you know, I tell this story, this other story, another, because if you do school-based research, you just sit in the office a lot. And so this kid came in, it was a big kid, right? And I was like, what are you doing in here? He's like, they were coming after me, they were coming after me, and I finally just lost it. I was like, oh, you threw some punches. And he, I said, oh, you're going to be in trouble. And then finally, I just said, what's your favorite subject? And we ended up talking for 20 minutes about math okay. and about post to higher education and what kind of math. Like, he, I didn't see him as a violent kid. Like, those are all those moments that's just so teachable. I know we say teachable, but for me, that just restores some strength that I have. Um, and I just keep at it. And I just, I think, you know, I got it pretty good yeah. in, comparison, in comparison. Yeah. You're learning a lot today about me, Sherry. <laughs> and it's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> that's what I always say is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I like learning about you. <laughs> so, you sit. So, do you teach that to you know? So, I'm thinking a little bit about not the, uh, you know about the. So, when you're sitting, so you spend a lot of time sitting in the office. When you have students in your lab, do you teach them like that? That's not a, a wasted moment or a moment just to like mm -hmm. f get on your phone, but that's like a moment to figure out what's going on in that school. How do you how do you do that? Yeah, so I mean, Anj can speak to this in some ways, but I mean, you will not do well in my lab if you come in with any sense of entitlement or any sense of you can be privileged as long as you know you're privileged. And so, yeah, I tend to have all the kind of social justice oriented. They, they gravitate towards the research that I do, I think. Sure. And so there's just an expectation that we are not in this ivory tower just to pr crank out articles. We do crank out articles. But we're in the community. We're giving back. And I have to tell you, so one of my students is graduating, Joey Marin. You know Joey. This kid is a great kid. Grew up in Cabrini Green. And um, other things I shouldn't say because they're videotaping. So he's getting a PhD and he just, and he, we did gangs and bullying stuff and he had some gang involvement in Chicago and then he was part of that kind of migration when they, Cabrini Green came down and they gave Section 8 vouchers to, to families. He ended up in central Illinois like many families from there. And um, he, in my life, this is an example and I could do this for all the 42 PhDs that graduated with me, um, that 
yeah, we collected data. But he also, when there was a gang shooting in Danville, Illinois, he went and he did emergency response. When there was a gang kid in seventh grade, you know, entrepreneur selling candy, he also talked to that gang member. And so, and so Lisa did the same Dale LaRue, my student. So it's just an expectation that we have a very different way of thinking about research to practice and narrowing that gap. And there's a social justice framework. And I have to tell you, I get to go to the University of Illinois. Graduation in a couple weeks where he is winning the Outstanding Doctoral Student Award. Like, oh my God, I'm gonna. So this, I mean, just beautiful. And he's going to be the leading developmental methodologist, but he's gonna be a leading developmental methodologist that gives back. And he's going to give back to the community and it's exactly what we need. So that's that expectation. And I think the students that interview, they get that message very, very clear. That if this is not something they, they wanna do, if they really just wanna crank out some articles and watch their H index go up and not have, uh, leave a mark, it's not the lab for them. Absolutely not the lab. Yeah. So you've been 22 years, and there are a lot of people here tonight who are earlier in their career trajectory than that, and we are super excited to have them all here. So uh, other than what you've just talked about, mm -hmm. like if you could, if you, you know, in that, that classic question, like if you knew then what you know now, like, or if you're thinking about today's climate, which is tougher in some ways perhaps even than it was back in the 90s, uh, what would you say to them? Yeah. One, find good mentors, right? So find people that are like-minded, and it would be in this group. So this is, a, this is a place to start those network, and I know it's exhausting to network, but do it. Um, and we want to retire, trust me. So we need to leave this place <laughs> in a good place. I mean, I'm just saying, right? Most people are like, you're not going to retire. It's like, watch me. i got a list going of what is going to happen during that retirement. So we want to be part of that, right? You know, I always say, you know, Katie Edwards is, where are you at, Katie? You're right there, right? So when I met her, was it even just a year ago? This is crazy. I feel like I've known you for like 100 years. And she's, you know, this emerging, I mean, pretty darn well-established uh, young scholar. And I just remember looking at her and going, yes, we can retire. So we want to mentor you through the process. If that's grant writing or networking and getting, because it is all about networking and in, in doing this work. I think that the balance, the challenge is balancing some of this broader dissemination work with the demands of whatever you need to do, whether it's get tenure or, or you don't have to go into the professorship. It's not everything for all everybody, right? So I don't know, are we, are we not promoting like non-professor type thing? Anyway, you can go work for CDC, you can work for NIJ, you can start your own nonprofit. I think any of those configurations you'll see in the room here. Um, but you have to collaborate. You're going to have to do this work with other folks. So figure out who, who you want to work with and collaborate with your, your graduate students once you go to graduate school. I know Allie's going to graduate school in Kansas. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That was nice to hear about Kansas, wasn't it? Yeah, that, yeah. but you're in Lawrence, you're fine. Um, <laughs> it'll be fine. That's right, yeah. Um, so I think doing that collaboration mentoring, the, the industry is such that you can't do it by yourself anymore. Don't you think? Uh, yeah, but let me, but break it down a little bit more. I mean, like what makes a good mentor? I mean, you like find a good mentor and I, you could probably even, like you said, maybe point to people, but, but what should they be looking for specifically? Well, yeah. One, you need from to, a distance, yeah. we all look alike, you know, in too many ways. Yeah, well, okay, <laughs> so hopefully you have some, you know, some intuition and you know who to stay away from. Um, I mean, I think that you, one, you've got to ask questions, right? So if there's little things that you can pay attention to. Um, do you notice that this particular mentor um, is sole author on a bunch of stuff that probably shouldn't be sole author, especially if it's school-based work, but then you notice that like John and Vicki and Sherry, that means collaboration. There's indications of collaboration. You also wanna be very, very careful on who you either partner with, whether it's on grants or projects, because they there are some folks that may not do their fair share. Um, but I think if you ask those questions, you're gonna to have to be creative about how you do that. And usually we make mistakes and you get burned a few times and you get better at it, right? Um, and I, you know, I think really paying attention to your early career opportunities. I mean, the beautiful thing is your students are here 
And this is an opportunity that should not be missed. I mean, there is no reason why these students in here shouldn't know some of these fabulous violence researchers and can pick their brain about their career trajectory. Uh, and I think you just have to kind of seek out people. And some, it's hard, right? So some people's personalities, networks, and completely exhausting and, and making those connections. You have to do it, Sherry. Yeah. Well, it networking. does feel kind it's of hard, vague, it's, right? It's yeah. hard to, to yeah. network. It is. Yeah. And some people don't like it. Some of my students are like, okay, I'm going to be a psychologist and I'm going to work nine to five and weekends off and I don't want to be you. <laughs> I'm like, that's okay. You have to do what makes you feel good inside, right, Katie? Like, whole, right? Um, so not, there's not one trajectory uh, to do this work. And what about your own career path? So where do you see yourself going for the next five or ten years? And can we steal all of your ideas? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm fully funded for five years. So I'm very, very excited about the projects that we're launching. We're ending about three now. But I have to tell you, I'm doing a suicide prevention randomized clinical trial in Colorado. And I just had a site visit where I had to go some, through. It's called Sources of Strength. And for, I felt like I was back in graduate school, like, you know, analyzing myself and we were going through the training and I am so excited that we're taking this protective factors approach to prevent suicide and sexual violence. Hopefully it'll work. Uh, um, so that's very exciting. That'll go on for the next couple of years. And the other one is a huge grant from the National Institutes of Justice to work very deeply with five years, the next four years, it's a $7 million grant to work with four high schools, four. You notice that I said 36 before, like this is four. And we've been doing focus groups for a year and a half to understand why, how it is that we can create school safety with youth voice. So we are developing a reporting app and other types of apps for kids, and the kids are developing it. And they're telling us exactly what are the barriers, why do they not feel safe, both physically and emotional. And a lot of the stuff that's coming out is the racism, discrimination, implicit bias. Um, and so that's going to be exciting. It's restorative practices in circles and social emotional learning and student campaigns. So really following up from our research that show that we have to approach high schoolers different and that they do have agency and that they do know what's happening as far as school safety. I mean, you know, I really, really hope I get this grant to train the 200 school resource officers in Miami-Dade around trauma-informed practices and implicit bias and all these other things. I'm hopeful. So much of the trajectory depends on, you know, these five grants that I just write if any of them hit. Um, but that'll take me through five years. And um, after that, I'm not sure. So it just depends. If those grants hit... And then if all the science money dries up, I'm just going to come hang out with you in Tennessee. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Tell the fam I'm on my way. Yeah. Um, so it really kind of depends. A lot of this, we've been fortunate, the scholars in the room, to have had justice money to the tune of $130 million the last couple of years. I think that's going to dictate the trajectory. Um, you know, if we have OCR, Office of Civil Rights, shut down and Title, Title IX and sexual harassment, um, prevention isn't happening, which is highly likely, then there will be a, another change um, if we take away rights of LGBT youth and resort back to the way we were handling these things 10 years ago, then I don't know. I'm going to have to step it up. So, um, I, you know, it all depends on that, really. And what about the field more generally then? So that's a full plate for you. You always have a very full plate. So if you could, so you talked about, for example, those meta-analyses like dropping out of the sky. So if like something could drop out of the sky for you that would make your work easier, like what would you like to see? I would like for our federal government to recognize that we need to do some serious work in our schools around discrimination and prejudice. And I wrote a grant to Justice too to do a prejudice reduction program with teachers in high school, like 60 high schools in Jersey. And it's a beautiful program. It's based on some really good evidence of what we know drives prejudice and discrimination in our schools. And we're going to train SROs and we're going to train teachers and we're going to have them look deep and we're going to use adv student advocates at the high school level. That for me would be a game changer if this federal government would fund that and recognize that we have to do this work or we're in big trouble. So that would be, that would be a game changer if they, they did that. And the reviews were really positive, so we, we revised, and we'll find out in just the next couple months. So that would be beautiful. 
Okay, great. Uh, do you want to take a see if anybody else has a couple questions? Any questions? Yes. Thank you so much for all of this. Um, I really am interested in how you see the diversity components being integrated into SEO. Well, I think we're just at the beginning of that conversation, so I gave you a hint. That's why I wanted to get Ann Gregory's chapter, because she's done a nice... Now, the Hoffman paper that we can make sure you get has some um, really good ideas of just, one, recognizing that we need to think about the diversity. And in some of the cases, so facing history in ourselves is somewhat of an SEL program and, and where there's a real discussion and a transparency about our history and the inequities um, for, you know, many families in school. So I think that's one process. I also believe that we need to do more of this work with pre-service teachers in our College of Education. Um, I, I don't know how much work we're going to do with the seasoned master teachers. They're set in their ways. They don't want to do anything different. Um, I, I'm concerned that the, the young ones are not getting enough of that. And, and I lived, worked, worked in a College of Education for two decades, and I saw just the the surface level treatment in the training because it's it's a crammed curriculum. I mean, we still have kids like undergrads line up and and they name attributes and then you move up if that describes your you know situation. And I, I think that we've um, there's some really good ed policy people in in education that are talking about this. It hasn't made its way to teacher education, and I think that's where it needs to be. I would also uh, think that our administrators. Largely, our administrators, whether they're principals or superintendents, very rarely have they taught in the classroom, and they certainly haven't had courses necessarily in child development or his educational history. And, um, you know, I don't, the other thing, so all of those things make sense, but I think we also need to recognize that we haven't made a lot of progress in educational equity um, in the many, many decades, right? And so, uh, just recognizing that would be a bonus, but we're 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 committed to it. I mean, I think that you know the work that AIR will do with this, and Roger Weisberg, and and the work that um, other scholars have done, that we need to do this. I'm optimistic that Anne Gregory will figure it all out, and then I can evaluate it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you want to say? Uh, yeah. Yes. Hello. Hey. So I get the sense that you follow more of the Stephen Russell plan of like no such thing as work-life balance. Like you work a lot. Can you talk about maybe having some of your self-care? Like what do you do to kind of help take care of yourself while doing all of this exhausting and important work? Because I think you work a lot more than probably most of us want to ever work. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And if anybody can hear it, like what, Dorothy, are your self-care mm -hmm. activities and how do you... You're right, Megan. She doesn't actually have any work-life balance. So coming up with but, something here. No, but, but but how do you you know maintain your energy through yeah. all of this? Um, I watch programs that I probably will not repeat out loud. <laughs> um, I was a little obsessed this year with Bachelor, mostly just because of what was her name. You know we who I'm talking know. about. <laughs> yes, somebody knows. Corinne. Thank you. Thank you. When Corinne was off. Two weeks before it was over, that was it. Even my nine-year-old nephew was like, did Corinne get booted off last night? I was like, yes, he did. I'm, she did. I'm not watching anymore. So that kind of resets me. I do watch 60 Minutes. I know it's going to sound like I just watch TV, but 60 Minutes on Sunday night and Sunday morning. I love Sunday morning. It feels good to me. There's always feel-good stories in that. If you don't watch it, you know, maybe you guys, when you get older, you watch this. Um, I, I used to run long distances. I often now run, walk shorter distances because I have bursitis in my hips because I overtrain because I overdo things. Um, I've started acupuncture because mostly just what happens with all the working is your body just slowly falls apart. So the acupuncture is really nice, but she gets really frustrated with me because like, she puts the needles in everywhere and then she's like, did you rest? I was like, no, but I just wrote an intro paper. I'm laying there with all my needles on. She's like, that's not how it's supposed to work. I was like, it works fine. It works fine. <laughs> Trust me. Like, you know, I'm not going to go all the way with this. Um, and I hang out with my nephew. Like my, he's, he's my SEL success story so far. He's nine. He was trying to bargain earlier to upgrade his flip phone to an iPhone. And I said, we will have a family meeting, and we will talk through. He's like, OK. So, so that's really kind of that. I love music. Like, I love me some hip hop. 
So if you look at my Pandora, you're like, what is wrong with her? <laughs> Literally, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, so we are uh, getting close to time. I'm getting the signal over there. So uh, so last words, Dorothy. No, just thank you, Sherry. Yeah. I feel so honored to be with all of you. Last year was so restorative when we had this that it just got me through a really rough year and a move. And so it's good to be with my peeps and meet some new peeps. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Dorothy.